Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Family members say they were friends. Now one is dead, the other is in jail, charged with murder. San Antonio police arrested 31-year-old Abel Garcia yesterday. He's accused of stabbing and killing 44-year-old Albert Adame. Adame's sister speaks to the night team Stephen Cavazos and reveals the tragedy, which she says no one saw coming. They called him Happy. That was his nickname. He's always had that name. Michelle Adame remembering her brother, Albert Adame, as a fun and loving man. But now she's speaking directly to the man accused of killing him. I just want to know why you did this. What I loved most. My only brother that I had left. 31-year-old Abel Garcia is accused of fatally stabbing Adama at his home off Harlan Avenue Friday afternoon. San Antonio police arresting Garcia yesterday. Adama's sister tells us her reaction after learning the news. I just lost it. I just started crying. Crazy. According to his arrest affidavit, Michelle told police she was sitting outside the home when she saw Garcia approaching. She says Garcia showed her a knife, which she says was stolen from her brother. At some point, a second man showed up, and all three entered the home where Albert was inside. It was during that time he was stabbed. Michelle told police she remembers seeing blood and Garcia holding the knife he had shown her earlier. She says she begged for her life, worried her son would be left without his mother. I don't want him to see me like that. Please don't kill me. But Michelle says there was never any altercation leading up to the stabbing and that Garcia and her brother were actually friends. She says Garcia was an aspiring tattoo artist and her brother even surprised him with new equipment to start the job. And my brother did all that for him the night before. Adama says Garcia gave her this tattoo, something she now wants gone. She says she's now living with painful memories etched in her mind forever as she grieves the man who gave others so much. I don't know how to let go of him. I don't know how to let him go. Stephen Cavazos, Case at 12 News. New on the night beat, police say a woman is in critical condition after flipping her car earlier this evening. It happened on West Martin Street. Police say the woman was speeding when she lost control, causing the car to crash into a pole and then flip over sideways. The woman was the only person inside the car and we're told she was partially ejected during that crash. People living nearby rushed to her car and were able to lift it off of her. Police estimate the woman was in her late 50s or early 60s. Fire crews say it was an electrical short that caused this fire at a home in the 300 block of Rasa tonight. When firefighters arrived on scene, they said they saw flames shooting through the roof in the back of the home. They were able to get inside and put those flames out pretty quickly. A family was home at the time, but everyone made it out safely, including their dog. Hardworking, loving, and giving. That's how family members describe 23-year-old Alberto Flores. He died yesterday in a hit-and-run crash on Highway 281. His family says Flores went out with his co-workers after work. They tell the night team's Jaffney Gray they are devastated, knowing he will never return home again. When um, she told me, and within two seconds, I was like, you're kidding, right? But after that, immediately, I was like, I just, I just broke down. I was like, not him. Like, he's not him. Pain and disbelief overwhelming the family of 23-year-old Alberto Flores, a man who San Antonio police say was struck and killed by a truck as he was walking along Highway 281 early Saturday morning. The driver taking off on foot after hitting Alberto, another vehicle, and a guardrail. How do you bear with news like that, that, that you know, your, your younger brother that you took care of your, you know, when you were a kid that is suddenly gone? Alberto's older brother, Daniel, says he was extremely hardworking. He calls Alberto his big brother, despite being two years younger than him. He was always working hard. He sometimes worked six, seven days just to save up for his car. Um, he was the actually the more responsible one than me sometimes. Alberto's family says when he wasn't at his job or working on his cars, which he loved to do, he was finding ways to spend time with his loved ones and neighbors. Alberto was probably one of the most given kids you ever want to meet. He would give you the right arm if he can. Alberto's family and friends now traveling from all over not to celebrate the Super Bowl, but to support his mother, father and brother during this tragedy. Daniel says as they try to move forward, he can only hope the person responsible for his brother's death does the right thing. There has to be some sort of justice that he never does this again, or at least he owns up to his mistakes. The fact that he run proved the fact that either he's already done something before or he just freaked out, which is understandable if you hit someone, but to own up to it. 
Now, Daniel added that if his brother had one message for viewers to take from his story, it would be to live life to the fullest, but to do so responsibly. Again, San Antonio police are still searching for the suspect responsible for this hit and run crash. As this investigation continues, if you have any information, they're asking anyone to call authorities immediately. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. Well, we've now learned the name of the seven year old girl who died in a crash last night involving a taco truck. The medical examiner says Avery Fabella died in the hospital after being critically injured in that crash. It happened just before 8 p.m. on Highway 90 and West Military Drive. Witnesses told police the car appeared to be speeding when its tire blew, slammed into a guardrail. It flipped over and then hit a taco truck. The woman driving the car and the man in the passenger seat are both still in the hospital. That man is believed to be Fabella's father, and at last check, he's in serious condition. Fire officials tell us it was an electrical, uh, an accidental power surge, rather, that caused a fire inside a home over on the southeast side. Those fire officials say CPS Energy working on a power line when the surge ran through a line into a utility closet connected to the house on Mercury Street. That caused the fire to ignite and also shorted out the water heater and washer and dryer at the home. Three people inside made it out safely before fire crews arrived. Damage to that home estimated to be about $55,000. A shooting on the north side overnight leaves one person dead and another in critical condition. It happened in an apartment complex on Vance Jackson. Our Alicia Barrera tells us what investigators are now looking for. Police say they have very little information to help them solve this case. And at this hour, they don't have a suspect identified. Therefore, they're looking into any possible evidence left behind by that alleged shooter, as well as looking into those claims made by the surviving victim. And police did have a heavy presence overnight at Park at Wall Street Apartments after they got a call from this first floor apartment you see on the screen. That was around 1140 last night. The call was for shots fired. Officers say they walked into the apartment and made their way to the living room where they found one woman dead with apparent gunshot wounds. In that same room, there was another victim who survived. He claims he was also shot. Here's what police say they're going off of for this investigation. The surviving victim claims there was a knock on the front door and when he opened up, shots were fired. But as of now, police have not given a description of the suspect and no arrest have been made in this case. And we did call the medical examiner's office. They say they don't have a positive identification on the victim. Police were able to state that the victim is a woman in her 20s. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Following confirmation of an eighth case of coronavirus here in the United States, Lackland Air Force Base has been designated as one of four quarantine zones for those who may be infected. Today, U.S. Representative Will Hurd of San Antonio providing some perspective. In a statement, Hurd says the Americans being returned from overseas travel in China will have been screened three times for coronavirus before disembarking at secured facilities at Lackland Air Force Base. These individuals will then undergo a 14-day quarantine to be closely monitored. His statement echoing Mayor Ron Nuremberg's, who also emphasized there was no risk to the community, saying, quote, we do not currently have any individuals diagnosed with the coronavirus here in San Antonio, and our Metro Health Department will continue to monitor the situation and exercise an abundance of caution. Officials at Lackland say there will be a hotel-like facility on the base, which will serve as a shelter for military personnel and American contractors traveling home from China. So far, more than 14,000 people have been infected with coronavirus worldwide. At least 300 people have died as a result in China, where it all started. We'll have the latest on the efforts to prevent the spread coming up later in this newscast. Well, it's much more mild outside this evening than the last few evenings. Temperatures are not dropping off quite as easily. We got up into the 70s today, but we're right now in the 60s. That compared to the 40s uh, yesterday, right around this time. Let's take a look at those current temperatures around San Antonio. It's 61 at the airport. It's uh, 59 up in Kerrville, 55 at Bernie Sage Airfield, 60 in Hondo, and 58 in Pleasanton. But our temperatures are going to be a bit wacky over the next couple of days. Tuesday, we'll be getting up to 80. But by Wednesday, we'll be in the 40s with a wind chill potential in the 20s and 30s. You guessed it, strong cold front coming up. I'll talk about our rain chances and even the possibility for a light wintry precip. So there's a lot to talk about. I'll have that forecast in just a few. 
Still ahead on the night beat, the number of people infected with the coronavirus around the world continuing to grow rapidly. What health officials here at home are doing to prevent the spread. And a suspect is shot and killed by London police after they say they stabbed two people in one of the city's busiest shopping areas. Details from the scene, plus why police are calling this a terrorist attack. Plus, Democratic presidential candidates trying to fire up Iowa voters and make one last appeal to people still struggling to make a final decision. The latest from the campaign trail, next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. Well, we have made it to the eve of the Iowa caucus. Democratic candidates making a full court press in their final hours of campaigning, greeted by overflow crowds. The first voting in the 2020 race expected to be a four way battle between Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg. Meanwhile, a heated battle suddenly erupting between President Donald Trump and a candidate who's not even there. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez has more from Des Moines. Some of the candidates hoping to score big in Iowa tomorrow, hosting Super Bowl parties and making supercharged final pitches to voters ahead of the caucuses. If the turnout is high, we're going to win. Senators Sanders, Warren and Klobuchar rushing from those final caucus eve events to catch flights back to Washington for the continuation of President Trump's impeachment trial. I'm asking you to take this over the goalpost for me. While in Iowa, former Vice President Joe Biden drawing what his campaign says is his biggest crowd yet in the state. You set the nation on a path to determine who their choices are. It was one of 60 campaign events held by Democratic presidential hopefuls today alone. We believe we're, we're the best campaign to go out there and beat Donald Trump. Some drawing overflow crowds. The bad news is there's no more room inside. <laughs> While other candidates look beyond this first big contest, former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg looking ahead to Super Tuesday, spending more than $300 million on ads, including one in tonight's big game. When I heard my glass stepping into the ring, I thought, now we have a dog in the fight. And because of a party rule change, he could have a spot on the Nevada debate stage, getting the attention of President Trump. You know, now he wants a box for the debates to stand on. Okay, it's okay. There's nothing wrong. You can be short. This is what happens when somebody like me rises on the polls. All of a sudden, the other candidates get scared, and I think Donald Trump knows that I can beat him. The candidates who are here are planning limited final events tomorrow ahead of the caucuses. And the senators in the race say they will turn around and come right back to Iowa in time to learn the results. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Des Moines. And if you're looking for an easy way to stay connected to the 2020 elections, KSAT News at 9 has a newsletter out right now to help you navigate campaign season. The Vote 2020 newsletter will have a new edition every Tuesday this year. If you're not signed up, that's okay. You can do so right now on our website. Just go to ksat.com slash newsletters. And a truly one of the silliest uh, celebrations we have in this country. <laughs> Puxatani Phil has spoken and spring will be here early this year. He said it, so it has to be true. As is tradition, thousands of people showed up at Gobbler's Knob in Pennsylvania this morning, bright and early, for Groundhog's Day celebrations. The legend goes, if the groundhog sees his shadow, there will be six more weeks of winter. And for only the 20th time in history, Phil didn't see it, meaning spring could be right around the corner. But we well, all know if you're following the weather here, <laughs> right around the corner, we've got a little bit of winter weather coming. It's the opposite of what he said. It's been spring-like, and well, now the winter's you know, coming. Phil may be the great prognosticator up in, in Pennsylvania, yes. but <laughs> we like to think that your weather authority has a decent handle on the forecast yeah, here. I trust you over Thank that. you. It is going to be much <laughs> over, over the rodent. <laughs> the grit. I feel she calls so, him the rodent. Thank you so much for trusting me over that guy. We believe you. Appreciate it. Uh, but we really are going to actually be seeing a cold blast of air that's actually going to make it feel like winter here, which it hasn't. For the entire month of January, we did not hit freezing, and we're probably going to see freezing in the middle of this week at some point. But today was a beautiful spring-like day, 76 for the high, well above average by 11 degrees. This morning, though, nice and chilly, 39 degrees out there. 
there. Let's take a look at our weather setup right now. You can see the clouds kind of moving in place. We've got mostly cloudy skies, even some light rain uh, for our southern KSAT 12 viewing counties down there. But generally here in San Antonio, we're going to stay dry in the overnight hours. It is much warmer though than it has been the last couple of nights because of those clouds kind of acting as a blanket to keep in the warmth from the day. It's in the low 60s right now in San Antonio and only in the upper 50s up in the hill country. That is about 10 to 20 degrees above above uh, what we saw this time yesterday. So a lot warmer, a lot more mild of an evening out there this evening and tomorrow morning as well. In the future cast, it's going to be quite interesting tomorrow. We're going to have mostly cloudy skies and just some isolated showers and possibly some isolated thunderstorms in the second part of the day. Uh, better rain chances uh, west of San Antonio and up in the hill country, but that potential is still there. So if you're planning your Monday. Just know that it'll be a bit cloudy in the morning, 55 degrees, so not chilly, uh, but definitely on the cool side. We'll be near 70 around noon, 72 in the afternoon for the high temperature. And again, second part of the day is when we'll introduce that chance for isolated showers and a couple rumbles of thunder. Not going to amount to much, but that potential for rain is there and we need rain, so we welcome it. Our weather set up across the nation, pretty quiet, but when we look at the temperatures, there's a stark contrast, cold core of air up to to the north right now and even colder air up in Canada. That's that cold Arctic air. Now it's very dense. Cold air is very dense. It sinks and it's going to spill across the United States in the form of a cold front. That cold front will make it to San Antonio by Tuesday evening. Uh, but during the day on Tuesday, we're still going to be warm. We're going to be near 80 degrees on Tuesday. Then that front will move down closer to San Antonio by the evening. This is going to be very cold air behind the front and there's even a small potential for some snowfall across Amarillo and Lubbock. Here here in San Antonio will likely experience light cold rain, but as that cold air kind of funnels into San Antonio and we dip close to freezing, there's still the potential for some precipitation left over. So as we get close to freezing, a light wintry mix up in the hill country and in the higher elevations around Bear County is possible, about 30%. Now, as far as accumulations go, going to be very little, not going to cause that many hazards on the roads as we can uh, see right now, but we will keep an eye on this. This is an evolving forecast that's going to come down to the degree, so we'll have updates for you. By Thursday morning, though, we are going to be near freezing, uh, close to freezing in downtown, but definitely freezing up in the hill country and in the higher elevations around Bear County. So, like I said, busy forecast. I don't think a rodent could go through all of everything no, I just no did way. right there. He'd just be like, that's right. Uh, but it is, go <laughs> of course, it's a it's a fun tradition, and I'm not <laughs> dogging on it. But I was. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> we will have more updates things. about that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. If you like Phil, go for it. It's fine. <laughs> we trust you more. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll be right back. And then there was just one, just one Super Bowl champion as the 2019 NFL season comes to a close with more on what's on instant replay. Let's check in with our Greg Simmons, a really exciting game tonight. Yeah, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs, Andy Reid, their coach, the first Super Bowl championship, and congratulations to Sarah, her team got to win tonight. There you go. And the Texan J.J. Watt makes his debut as a host of Saturday Night Live, coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay on Super Bowl Sunday. Chiefs are Super Bowl champions here in Miami. They win it here in Super Bowl 54. The Kansas City Chiefs take home the Lombardi Trophy when they won Super Bowl 54 tonight in Miami. A first for Andy Reid. We'll have all the highlights quarter by quarter. We'll take you inside both locker rooms for all the Super Bowl celebration. But that's my focus. Um, I've got a lot of confidence in something that will get done here soon. All right, Dak Prescott still doesn't have a new deal with Dallas. Will the Cowboys use a franchise tag in order to keep Prescott in Dallas, or will the two sides reach a long-term deal before the March deadline? The sports guys are back tonight with their thoughts. Who was the MVP and the coach of the year in the NFL? They passed out the hardware last night before the big game today. Oh, fine. I like that one. Here we go. Okay, whenever you're ready. You will see that sack? I hope our quarterback's okay. This other team is good. Nice. 
<laughs> he would rather have been playing in the Super Bowl, but J.J. Watt still made his national news as the Texans defensive star made his debut as a host of Saturday Night Live. How did he do? We will show you. And it's not just the Super Bowl today. Our Jessica Hunt will bring the highlights of both the puppy and the kitten balls. All that plus, what can we expect from this year's rodeo road trip? And what was the best commercial money can buy in this year's Super Bowl? Tonight, you decide. Instant Replay is live. And it's after the night beat. And my favorite's not even on our finals. So I'll tell you what it is. Come on. Big game is over. All the commercials are over, but you're just getting started. Just tonight. getting started. You got it. All right. We'll see you in a little bit, Greg. Still to come on the night beat, new safety directives for U.S. airports as the threat of the coronavirus continues to grow overseas. What to know the next time you're at the airport. Plus, police say he had a fake bomb strapped to his chest and was wielding a machete. The latest details from the scene of what London police are calling a terror attack. And what's up, South Texas? Also ahead, this week we spoke with a man with a passion for professional haircuts. He tells us how a medical condition sparked his drive to be the best. Tonight, the coronavirus showing no signs of slowing down. More than 14,000 people have now been affected worldwide. That number only continuing to grow at a rapid pace. At least 300 people have died in China where this all started. A U.S. officials now taking action just a short time ago. ABC's Trevor Alt with what they're trying to do to keep us safe as another confirmed case is reported. The U.S. has temporarily closed its doors to foreign nationals who recently traveled to China. The move taking effect at 5 p.m. Eastern Sunday, part of an effort to slow the expansion of the novel coronavirus as Massachusetts confirms its first case. This, this is a real thing. It's shock at first. I was kind of scared. The patient, a college student who traveled to Wuhan, China, the epicenter of the outbreak, now at home in isolation. There is no fear right now of coronavirus as far as spreading to the city of Boston or, or to my knowledge to come out to Massachusetts. In Wuhan, an emergency hospital with a thousand beds set to open its doors Monday. It was built in just 10 days. In Hong Kong, healthcare workers voting to strike this week over the government's refusal to seal its borders with mainland China, as other countries have done. ABC's Ian Panel is there. We've been speaking to a nurse who told us that staff don't even have enough high quality protective gear and that some patients from China have been found to have at first lied about whether or not they've been to Wuhan only admitting later on after they became seriously ill that they had in fact been there. And now we're the first death outside China, a 44 year old man in the Philippines from Wuhan. While in Italy, doctors announcing they've isolated the DNA of the virus, hoping that discovery may help lead to containing its spread. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. Amidst the threat of the coronavirus, a few more specifics from the TSA's new security directive for airlines here in the U.S. The airlines will now be required to ask all passengers booked on flights from outside of the U.S. if they have been to mainland China in the last 14 days. And Chinese nationals coming in from China and connecting through foreign airports will not be allowed to travel here. U.S. citizens who have been to China in the last two weeks will have to be rebooked to one of the seven gateway airports. Again, those new guidelines are effective immediately. We are learning more tonight about an apparent terror-related incident in London where police have shot and killed a suspect. The 20-year-old man, whose identity has not yet been released, was reportedly wearing a fake bomb strapped to his chest and wielding a machete. He was shot following an incident along a busy shopping area this afternoon. London Metropolitan Police at first believed that several people had been stabbed, but now are only reporting that just two people had stabbing injuries. One of them is in critical condition tonight. Police say... The scene was fully contained after the suspect died and there was no further threat. A member of parliament from the area where, of London where that all happened spoke out about the incident. Streatham's a, a wonderful community, extremely diverse, um, and we haven't had an issue uh, like this as, as, as far as back as I can remember, and I've lived here my entire life. Um, it, it's very sad. It is also quite scary uh, for people in Streatham, but I would encourage them not, not to be afraid. The police do have the situation under control. The suspect apparently on the radar of British counterterrorism before today's attack. That same parliament member says he had been under surveillance after being released from prison, having served a sentence for Islamic-related terrorism offenses. 
To New York now, where Governor Andrew Cuomo is deploying additional resources to continue helping those in Puerto Rico. They're recovering from multiple earthquakes, while some parts of the island are still rebuilding after Hurricane Maria. Governor Cuomo is sending 26 bilingual mental health professionals and 25 building inspectors to lend a hand. New York's Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul and Secretary of State Rosanna Rosado are leading that delegation. The group will head to Puerto Rico on Tuesday. A Navajo code talker has died. Joe Vandever uh, Sr. died Friday in Haystack, New Mexico. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez says he was born into the Red Running into the Water People Clan. Vandever enlisted in the Marines back in 1943. The U.S. military used the Navajo language during World War II to communicate in a way that the enemy could not understand. Joe Vandever is uh, survived by a large family that includes 55 great-grandchildren. He was 96 years old. Well, we've got a blanket of clouds out there right now, and those clouds are kind of helping to keep in the heat of the day. We got up to 76 degrees this afternoon, and so as you can see, those clouds are kind of hanging around a bit. So complete cloud cover around San Antonio at the moment. A few peaks of sunshine down southeast, but take a look at these temperatures. Pretty mild out there. You don't even really need a heavy coat. 61 in San Antonio, 59 in Kerrville, and 58 in New Braunfels. As we wrap up the weekend and look toward next week, it's going to be pretty interesting going from 80 to the 30s. Got to look at that forecast coming up. Still ahead, we're putting the spotlight on a local man who says it was a medical scare that helped him discover his true passion. That's next on What's Up South Texas. And a little later, it was a week opening for nearly every new movie. We'll check out the weekend box numbers for you anyways. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Bringing professionalism back to barbering. That is the goal of 27-year-old Tim Torres, a man who is not only a passionate barber, but he's also hoping to share his knowledge with others. He's our next feature on What's Up South Texas, a segment where we highlight unique individuals in our community. Jaffney Gray tells us it was a serious medical issue that fueled his teaching abilities. Nice haircut. What separates an average haircut to a good haircut is the attention to detail put into the cut. 27-year-old Tim Torres is not just a barber, Dang. but he's the owner of his very own barber college. My whole goal is bringing that old school feel back to the barber industry. When he's not behind the chair with clippers in hand, Flick of the wrist. he's teaching others about the craft. This is the most important part of the razor because this is where your control comes from. What is it called? Shank. The shank. So I was 12 years old when I first actually picked up a pair of clippers to cut my hair. He taught himself to cut his own hair because his mom couldn't afford it. I actually started sketching like side profiles of faces and doing designs and doing haircuts. He became a licensed barber six years ago. I've seen enough that, you know, I have enough life stories and life lessons that I've learned in the barber industry that I can be able to be that mentor, that role model that I need to be for these upcoming barbers. Abruptly, his dreams of opening Cut and Shave Barber College hit a snag last year. If I hadn't trusted in God, I don't know where I would have been. Tim was diagnosed with a brain tumor. I was scared to death, especially with I could potentially leave my daughters. My little daughters at the time was only two years old, and I thought that I was probably going to die. But his diagnosis lit a fire under him. My life is more valuable than me just being behind the chair. I could share all this knowledge and all of this passion that I have with everybody else. So that's kind of really what forced me and pushed me into my destiny. And attention to detail. Tim is definitely the type of person that when he has it on his mind, he's going to achieve it. So just seeing him achieve his biggest and wildest dreams and being there with him every step of the way has just been so honoring to me. Miraculously, Tim's tumor dissolved within just three months, allowing him to open his barber college in October, a college meant for people of all ages and backgrounds. Everybody's free to be themselves here. You know, we just want people to come in and discover them, their true potential. Tim's perseverance to educate others about the professionalism of barbering is a fresh buzz for What's Up South Texas. The impact that they're going to have on others is going to be way bigger than what any amount of dollar that they can have because not only are we barbers, but we're mentors. Now what's next for Tim is that he says he hopes to expand and grow so that he can continue to teach others the knowledge of barbering that he's been blessed with. 
I just think it's so cool that he is really getting in tune with the younger oh, people, yes. too. Oh, yeah, It was very them. inspiring walking in there. They had their own little classroom. He, as you can tell, he was teaching them every part of anything dealing with in the barber industry just to make it more professional. Love it. Another person doing great things in our community. Thanks for sharing that story. For people who have never bought a home, the idea can be daunting. Some helpful tips on how to get the ball rolling in our series, Money, It's Personal. That's next. Buying a house can be intimidating when you have no idea what to expect, but there are some steps you can take to make sure you're prepared for what's ahead. Digital journalist Ivan Herrera on what you need to do before you make an offer on a home. This is Amy. She finally decided to take a leap and buy a home after saving money for a down payment. While Amy is excited, she also knows it's one of the most important financial decisions she'll make in her life. Lucky for her, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has some tips on what to do before making an offer on a home. First, Amy needs to check her credit scores. Lenders use these scores to determine if someone is a good candidate for a loan and to also figure out what interest rate to offer a borrower. Next, Amy needs to assess her current spending situation. Buying a new home means more expenses, so she'll need a clear understanding of where her money is going. Now that Amy has a better picture of her spending habits, the CFPB recommends she come up with a budget to decide how much she can afford to spend on a monthly mortgage payment. Since Amy has set aside some money to put toward the house, she can now determine her down payment after learning how her finances work. She'll need to figure out how much money she'll need for moving expenses, closing costs, utility setup fees, and all other expenses that come with buying a home. Next, Amy needs to figure out how much to spend on her new home and decide if now is the right time to buy. She needs to compare home prices in her target area. If Amy can't afford her ideal home in the area she wants, she may need to wait until she can save for a higher down payment. The CFPB says Amy should also make a list of friends, family members, co-workers, or other people she trusts who have bought a home or refinanced a mortgage recently to help her through the process. And since she's a first-time homebuyer, a housing counselor may also be able to assist her. Finally, Amy needs to create a loan application packet to start exploring her loan choices. The packet will need to have information that lenders need to determine how much she can borrow and her interest rate. Ivan Herrera, KSAT 12 News. And we know that was a lot of information, so we have some extra tips from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau on how to prepare before shopping for a home. Just head to KSAT.com slash news at night. You know, it honestly feels like we had winter in October this year, and yeah. then ever since then, it's just kind of been like yeah. spring. There was that cold blast in November where yeah. we got a little bit of wintry precip, especially mm -hmm. up in areas like Leon Springs and up toward mm -hmm. Bernie, so the hill country. And then it, it's just been warm since right. then. It's it been... worries me that it's going to be a hot summer. <laughs> yeah, and it, I'm happy to report there's no correlation, right. so it, it's not like this is an indicator that it's going to be an extremely warm summer. But we are going to get another shot of very cold air and kind of like last time, it has the potential to bring a light wintry mix up in the hill country. But today we were warm, 76 degrees in San Antonio, out in Del Rio where there's extreme drought at the moment. 80 was the high. It was near 80 in Carrizo Springs. It was in the low to mid 70s up in the hill country, uh, warmer than average by about 10 to 15 degrees. Now we do have a pretty stout breeze from the southeast right now at about 15 miles per hour. That's tapping into that Gulf of Mexico moisture, and we're starting to see a little bit of Gulf humidity try to make its way closer to San Antonio. Anywhere you see this uh, green color, that's where humidity is a little higher. In fact, humidity is a little higher uh, by 20 degrees degrees out uh, along the coast at the moment. This is going to be one of the ingredients for the potential for some isolated 
uh, showers and storms tomorrow for your Monday as we start the week. We'll have mostly cloudy skies and again you can see in the future cast that a couple of light showers are possible, especially in the second part of the day. Even a few rumbles of thunder up in the hill country as a piece of energy works its way closer to San Antonio by Monday night and into early Tuesday morning. So we'll keep an eye on that again. It's only going to be isolated, not any scattered showers and storms. Uh, and if you do get a little bit of rain, that's a good thing because of the drought going on right now. Tomorrow, starting off cloudy, 55 degrees. Notice that that's a little bit warmer than the last few mornings. Last few mornings, we've been in the upper 30s, so you won't necessarily need that heavy coat tomorrow morning as you're heading to work. And then a small chance for isolated showers and storms in the second part of the day, but we'll still be warmer than average, topping off right near 72, and we'll have a breezy wind from the south up to 15 miles per hour at times. Quiet right now across the central plains, just some snowfall across parts of uh, Idaho and Utah. But notice as we look at the temperatures, just how much colder that air is up to the north, starting to see some teens work their way down right along the US Canada border. And that cold core of air is sitting pretty in the north right now, just waiting to spill across the United States. And that's what's going to happen. A real deal Arctic cold front is going to approach San Antonio over the next few days. Tuesday is going to be one of those days where if we look at the temperature map, temperatures will be in the teens in the panhandle and will be near 80 degrees for the afternoon high in San Antonio, potentially even some 90s down at the RGV. So we'll keep an eye on that. It's just really going to uh, start to uh, spill across and probably make it to San Antonio by Tuesday night. Temperatures will drop by 20 to 30 degrees in some places. This front also has the potential for some uh, wintry precipitation, especially up across parts of uh, the San Angelo, Midland, Odessa area, and even up toward Dallas. But here in San Antonio, we'll experience a cold rain. It's likely that uh, there's going to be a couple of uh, hours where we could see a wintry mix up in the hill country, but nothing is likely going to stick too much. So we'll keep an eye on that. For you too. A lot to keep an eye on today with the temperatures getting close to uh, about freezing by Thursday morning. So it's going to get cold. It's going to be a really drastic temperature difference. A lot of people walking around in shorts on Wednesday because they won't know what hits them. And you're going to have all those kids all excited, thinking they're going to get a delay or something. Or... <laughs> you know, and some people may jump the gun with that, but we'll just have to keep an eye on it for you. Right. Got to keep an eye on and wait. KSAT weather app, handy. Right. It is really handy. Notifications right to your phone. Congratulations on that Chiefs yeah. win. Super Bowl weekend <laughs> proving to be a bad one for the newcomers at the box office. A look at the weekend numbers right after this break. So what is that? Is that bar? The gentleman took fifth place in its second weekend out, grossing six million dollars. Gretel and Hansel opened at number four with 6.1 million, slightly more than it cost to make. Robert Downey Jr. and Doolittle managed to stay in third place, picking up 7.7 .7 million. Colonel McKenzie is in command of the second. He sent word yesterday morning he was going after the retreating Germans. The award-winning war drama 1917 is at 119 million domestic after a second place weekend worth 9.7 million dollars. Mike, Mike, Relax. Mike, bus, 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 back! The long-awaited threequel Bad Boys for Life took the top spot for the third straight weekend, making $17.7 .7 million for a domestic total of $148 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Our Spurs are on a roll as they hit their annual rodeo road trip with a two-game win streak, including their dramatic come-from-behind win last night. And just how difficult will the Spurs' rodeo road trip be this year? Let's head to Greg Simmons to find out on Instant Replay. In one word, very. <laughs> <laughs> and we get to visit with the three-time Olympic gold medalist in San Antonio before the 2020 Tokyo Olympics this summer, coming up tonight on a brand-new edition of Instant Replay. You know, to be honest, there could have been times where we uh, could have thrown in a towel after that first half, um, you know, with, with the performance that we had. But like I said, um, this is a, a tough group. The Spurs head off to their annual rodeo road trip with their biggest comeback win of the season. After being down by 19 points, they roar back to sting the Hornets for back-to-back -back wins before making way for the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. And we'll get you ready for four big games this week, including the Clippers and the Lakers in L.A. to tip it all off starting tomorrow. I mean, it's going to be competitive, uh, and so, I mean, the, the first step is, is Olympic trials, and we've got a really stacked field for, for American backstroke, and so I, I kind of view that as, as a rehearsal. 
He's a three-time Olympic gold medalist in swimming, and this year has his sights set on the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo, but not before Ryan Murphy stops in San Antonio and visits with our own Andrew Seeley, who also brings us highlights of the high school regionals in swimming this weekend. SAFC starts training camp, the Rampage, another very successful pink in the rink night, and our Jessica Hunt visits the TMI basketball team coming off one heck of a run. Of course, we will bring you all the highlights and post-game coverage from the Super Bowl in Miami, the best commercials from this year's game, and J.J. Watt was front and center on Saturday Night Live. Instant replay is live, and it is next. If that football thing doesn't work out for him, he might have a career. <laughs> might have another career going. I got you. Thanks, Greg. Sure. We'll be right back.